there's no music if you have no body to play it with. So take care of your body first. You getting into the gym and you lifting weights and working on muscles is it's physical therapy for the benefit of your playing. The truth is nothing works like just taking care of the simple stuff. Diet, exercise and sleep. Take care of that and you'll be fine. Join us as two musicians and fitness coaches discuss strength, wellness and fitness in relation to musicians, artists and performance. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Tuned and Strong podcast. This over here is Angela McHouston of Music Strong. And this is Dr. Jen Cabas May of Tuned and Toned Performance. Mm -hmm. And we have a very special guest with us today is Dr. Joanne Callan White. Dr. Joanne, how are you doing today? Um, good. Thank you so much for having me. Jo Joanna, yeah. No, sorry, I knew I was going to speak it up. We talked before about how the thing we screw up. Uh -huh. Screw something up. <laughs> sorry. No Thank problem. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So uh, we're do kind of doing a um, a Tales from the Committee series. So I've I've reached out to all the members of the uh, National Flute Association Performance Health Committee at the moment. Well, not everybody, but most everybody, just to see who'd be interested in talking because everybody on the committee has got a unique something they're dealing with. And if it, you know, what we do on this show is we, we highlight how music and fitness come together, music and health, all those things, you know, performance related injuries and things that musicians deal with. And um, we have only had two other people talk about focal dystonia. We know that you know a lot more than we do. So we would just love to know a little bit about you, where you are, and, and just go from there. Sure. Well, thanks. Yeah, I was on the committee. It was a great to be on the committee with you. So, um, yes. So I am a flute professor and a flutist in orchestras and in chamber music. And I did have experience, I do have experience with focal dystonia. I also studied it some uh, and wrote about it, uh, co uh, collecting information for the National Flute Association for Flutist Quarterly. And, and um, so I put in a lot of time with that. I experienced it myself. Uh, I am very lucky to have learned to live with it and very uh, time consuming, long process, very difficult process. But I actually um, came to the point where I did reclaim my ease of playing. And um, so I feel very lucky with that. Um, it's not, of course, easy to do that. And so I know that you wanted to, I, I know you've had some great guests on um, uh, who have different at, uh, perspectives on that. And I can let you know, that. tell me what you want to know. Well, to start, if, unless you've got something. No, I was just going to say, I mean, just, just tell us your story. You know? like, yeah. That's, that's what we're really looking for, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> sure. So, so I did have a time in uh, 2009 when I played a concert, an orchestra concert with notes above the range of the flute, very, very loud and, and had a sort of a lip injury, didn't know what was going on at the time. Um, so an overuse kind of an injury and it didn't go away for a few weeks, but by the, the time I saw a neurologist, it was gone. And that was the end of that for many years, a long time. But the point I'm setting up is that I had an injury at one point, um, that left me a little bit vulnerable. And then in 2012, um, I learned a beatboxing piece and beatboxing doesn't cause focal dystonia, but it's strenuous. And I did this new technique very much in a row and really try, uh, was excited about learning the piece. And uh, that provided a little stress and I'd had a previous injury. I was also under a lot of medical stress, um, some medical, um, very um, worrisome things and stress, very stressful medical things. So a lot of stress from that. And um, I started to get lip tremors uh, after the beatboxing and 
than I was about to perform at National Flute Association convention uh, with my husband, my duo, the Crescent duo. We were about to um, flute clarinet. <laughs> I know you're flute and clarinet. <laughs> and <laughs> we were about to perform in Las Vegas. And I was worried about the lip tremors because this was a return of the tremors I'd had after that overuse injury. And I uh, went to the performance. Of course, it's a very high um, pressure um, performance. And because I was worried about this, all of a sudden, everything started shaking. My fingers and arms started shaking. My lips started shaking. Not things I'd ever had happen before in a performance. And what's what fires together gets wired together. And mm. after that, that was the beginning of, I think, of the... Uh, the focal dystonia. After that, every time I would lift my instrument to play, my fingers would shake and my lips. So focal dystonia, it what it is, as I know you know, you've talked to a lot of people and know about it yourselves uh, through your work. Um, but it's a it's a disruption of brain signals so that um, a motion that was once easy, a, a very well trained motion. Um, from an athlete or a musician or somebody who does something that's been trained over many hours and you know how to do it it's very natural and easy but the um a mix of things comes together biological physiological psychological social the environment things are there and something can change in the brain we know the brain as you know has neuroplasticity so it can change both in good ways, but also in a negative way. And in focal dystonia, the signals get confused and wired so that if you go to do a motion like press down a key uh, this way that you've always done, and all of a sudden your brain will tell you and it will make an opposite motion, an opposing motion. The opposing muscles will start to fire at the time that you're supposed to be doing this, they will do this. So the, the, it's a brain signal crossing. And um, so so the way... Quick so question. I, yes. Would you, when I'm trying to explain this to people, the simplistic way that I say it is that it's an overuse injury of the brain, but that's not exactly accurate then, is it? It's not so much overuse as something gets confused. Something gets... It's like... Um, I've seen somebody say in a in a in a presentation, it's like you come. Somebody comes into your house and rewires your oh. house, so that so you, you go turn to... on you turn on the light switch and it doesn't do what it did before. And the dishwasher turns on. <laughs> right. <laughs> that would be weird. Right. Okay. And it's it's a so it's a it's a neurological movement disorder mm -hmm. and it's confounding it's very difficult there are many famous musicians that have had it but also famous athletes um, because they do motions that are very well trained and then their body can get so they suddenly don't feel right that's usually the first kinds of symptoms is something the the proprioception is off what felt not natural and normal before um, so I also had somebody to describe it. Um, I did some interviews with people and somebody described it to me as, um, and, and now I describe it. You, you, you go to, think about this for a minute, pick up a pencil with your non-dominant hand and write your name. So you know what it should feel like to write your name. You know what letters are supposed to look like. Ooh but it doesn't feel right. It's just something, it just feels odd. It feels, and that's what happens in focal dystonia is that something, one part of your body, or in my case, two parts, something feels off, it doesn't feel right. Sometimes people get small warning signals first. Sometimes it comes on very suddenly. Sometimes it comes on very gradually. Um, but something is just not quite right. And it doesn't, you can't make the same you can't, you lose your ability to express what you are always had before. And of course, that is, can be an identity crisis. It's very difficult. It's very hard. It's very sad. It's very frustrating. 
No kidding. But I think, I think, um, you know, I, I think, you know, part of my story is uh, the, the journey of trying to figure out how to retrain my brain to avoid the dystonic triggers, the triggers that got me confused and do things in a slightly different way because dystonia doesn't really disappear. It's just you learn to use different brain pathways. You train your brain to use different pathways so that you can do you can reclaim that ease. And and for some people that that happens. For some people it hasn't happened. But we know now more about about the fact that sometimes it's possible. And the th confusing thing is that everyone's brain's different, so there's no manual of exactly how to do it. And and there are a lot of things involved. You know. Um, um, asymmetry of muscles working less hard, hard on one side and so compensating on another side. I know in your work, you work with people. And so there are all kinds of things to learn about it. And I, I went, I had, was very lucky to find some people that were really influential in helping me um, find my way. I also did a lot of things myself to, to work on it. And it took about five years, but I now, most of the time can avoid those triggers. And I, I'm still playing principal flute in my orchestras. I've made recordings with my chamber groups. I, I teach and demonstrate. So I'm very lucky and I realize how lucky that is. And um, I should say, I know you talked to Anna Detari who's doing such great um, work with that and working with people and studying it. And I don't do what she does and help people with it. But one thing I do is I'm always happy to chat with people because because it's hard, you know, to find people that are willing to talk about it because musicians don't want to draw attention to, you know, what's going wrong and because we can't. Um, but but um, so it's hard to find people that will talk about it. It's also very hard to find people who are playing with it successfully because they don't want to draw attention to that. And so anyway, I'm always happy to chat with people. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't coach people or, or that, but I'm always happy to talk and share my story. And I apologize. I interrupted you in the middle of said story and you had just said you got on the, <laughs> sorry, you got on stage and that all happened at, in Vegas. And I was at Vegas for that conference. Oh, it was hot. Who thought going to Las Vegas in August would be a good idea? It was about 100 <laughs> was so 107, 108. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was Great. literally, I, I got off the plane and my phone said 107 degrees. <laughs> it's like the surface of the sun. What are we doing here? <laughs> you know, but you were, uh, and, and even, ahead. and even now, one of the things that triggers, um, the dystonia for me is heat. Heats. Uh -huh. Interesting. So, does that have anything to do with that? I don't know. It could have more to do with physiological things in the body anyway, but um, definitely that's one of my triggers. So I have to be careful not to um, not to um, walk up to the concert hall before the concert so I don't get overheated. So what happened when you were on stage and then all that happened? Take us back to there and then what, what was your journey from there? Because I interrupted you. Apologies. Oh, no, no, no. Um, so it was... Uh, quite disorienting because I'm, you know, I usually before that had always enjoyed performing and um, hadn't really experienced that kind of um, physiological reaction. And um, it was pretty scary. And, um, and then the fact that it didn't go away. And, and, and I'm talking about this is not something with dystonia. It's not necessarily that something that happens only under pressure. I mean, this would happen in my practice room after that, you know, just when I took my flute out. So dystonia is not, it's not only something, it, I mean, I don't, my hands would not shake in the air as with some, I mean, you have to rule out things like essential tremor, which are medical things that happen to people that cause tremors. And my symptoms were so mild at first that it took a while to get diagnosed, even at the Cleveland Clinic with someone who was famous for diagnosing focal dystonia, but but it never went away. And, um, uh, you know, at least not within that year. And then finally, well, yeah, that, that 
that is what everything fit the the people's stories of dystonia it's a process of elimination right there's no test for it but everything when you read about people's stories who have it everything i had going on fit into that i play suddenly flat and um it it, it just things weren't right things weren't working the way they normally were and I think I confused the neurologist at first because I had it both here and here, mm -hmm. but it's a brain focal dystonia. Focal means one part of the body, but, but it's in your brain. And so, yeah, it can happen. It can, it can migrate from one part to another. Um, but, but I'm, I'm really, oh, so it was really frightening to be in that situation, but I found, um, I read a lot about it. I talked to people. I was lucky enough to find people who were sharing information. I know there's um, uh, a lot of information out there. By the way, that article and bibliography I compiled for Flutus Quarterly, I'll send you the link for that. So, because I think, because I wrote an article about it after I learned a lot about it to kind of lay it out there for people. What do you watch for? What could it be? What might cause it? What might, I mean, there are a lot of unknowns about focal dystonia still, but there are a lot of theories. And so I laid out a lot of those in the article. And even though it was uh, quite a few years ago now, that article is still a pretty good, um, I think, summary and explaining things really clearly and what might be happening. And I, but the bibliography is a lot of reading about it. And sure, in the last few years, there's new stuff but um, I'll read, there's still enough there that um, that's useful to look at, I think. Um, but I got distracted. Now I lost that. But oh, what I was saying is that so I so I, I read a lot about it and I went to people and found a lot of people who helped me in different ways. And I think David David Vining, um, the trombonist in Arizona, he he calls it a cocktail appro approach that people try this and this and this and this. It's not one thing that magically fixes it, but you combine some of the mental things to help, some of the physical things to help, some of the brain training things to help. And if, if you can find your way, and, and I found people like Farias, and I know you had some of your previous guests talk about Joaquin Farias in Toronto. Mm -hmm. um, the Spanish researcher. Yep. Yep. And, the pianist, um, right? Um, and I think he was, he played other instruments beside that, besides that too. But he's also a scientist. He has some science degrees, um, biomechanics. And he really helped me. He, <clears throat> he works a lot with people with movement disorders, not just musicians. And he really helped me to understand the actual muscles that in me had gone haywire, the actual muscles, not just, oh, your brain's confused, but this muscle's compensating for this and try this exercise for this. And he also understood a lot of the brain issues. And and for me, it was difficult. He, he seemed to understand that for me, it was difficult for some people have terribly severe symptoms, so they can't even focus the tone with me. It was more subtle, so it was a little tremory, but I could keep playing. And some people didn't. They kept saying, well, I don't notice anything, but I felt panicked in trying to play in the orchestra. Like, is it going to work? And but but it's confusing when people don't hear it and they think you're imagining it or making it up, which you are definitely not doing. And um so so he says, you know, Farias said, you know, that's that's hard too when when people don't it's not a visible disability. So people don't always understand all that goes into it. So he was helpful in that way. And I also had other people um and, you know, I, I went to many people plus working it on myself, but some of the most helpful I did have a um a physical therapist who had a lot of ideas about working with dystonia because she had worked with people with writer's cramp, which is a one aspect of focal dystonia when you go to write and it doesn't, it doesn't feel right or work right. And she, so she, and she had all these theories. I can tell you about them later, not right this minute, but she had all these theories. She ended up helping me with physical therapy, but then also 
kind of doing a study to work more on the brain retraining parts of things. So she was she was studying me. So she was working almost like a coach, a focal dystonia coach. And that, that was extraordinarily helpful. And she tried some really unusual things with what graded motor imagery, which comes from um, working in physical therapy with chronic pain injuries. And she applied some of that to focal dystonia. And it, she, she got disrupted in actually writing about that when the pandemic hit. So I don't know if she's, but I hope she will actually write it out because I think some of the things she did with me were really helpful. And then I worked with a psychotherapist who helped with the anxiety part of it and the identity part of it of suddenly not being able to do what I'd always been able to do and what was I going to do about it and and this new performance anxiety which for me had not been there so much before but suddenly it was debilitating because should I be doing this and she helped me with that part of it so um you know there were a lot of people a lot of people and many more people than that that's just some of the some of the most useful, but I just experimented in so many different ways. And I know you probably have questions, but I have one big thing that was kind of unusual that helped me too. And that is I, I accidentally happened coincidentally to be starting writing at the time that the focal dystonia hit and I had discovered creative writing again. Um, I performed with a poet. Uh, my husband and I performed a piece with a poet and had had a poet read the poetry that went with the piece and we we I got inspired I we got to be friends I ended up starting writing again poetry which I had not done since a child and then later I ended up taking a class a university class in that and then I took another one I couldn't stop I started writing and there was something about when I was losing my ability to express myself through music, I was incredibly lucky to have just discovered another voice. And um, it, it was just amazing because not only did that help me to think about it, to write about it, to share it with people, I ended up later um, incorporate, there were some poems about focal dystonia or about music and now I'm doing more creative nonfiction writing about it and exploring some of the things like how did this happen for me? What, you know, how did how did I make it through that? Um, but but one of the things um, I don't know, I mean, I mean, I even have I have a poem about mu musicians focal dystonia in the Journal of the American Medical Association um, poetry column. So I mean, I can even share that with you later if you want me to. But but somehow that helped. And what I found is that when I went around, I ended up doing a lot of readings or presentations, even with my flute, but at conferences like the flute conference or medical humanities conferences or um, uh, uh, other different places. And I found that people, not just musicians would respond to this story, but also anybody who had suddenly lost an ability to do something that was once so natural a part of their life. And so a lot of people would say, oh, you know, when I had a running injury or, and so a lot of people would respond to the story. So for me, that really helped. Um, you guys, I'm sure know uh, Gerald Clickstein of Musician's Way uh, fame, his great um, book, of, you know, he writes so much about being an artist and a musician and and about musicians injuries and he um, came to visit our university at Central Michigan University and he came to be a guest for a day yep yeah, that's the that's the one in and, case anybody's uh, wondering about the book she's referencing yeah I'll be honest I haven't read it but I've owned it for like 10 years it's one of I those. love that I love that book but he but he he visited and was talking about all kinds of things and I was walking to lunch with him and I told him, you know, I, d I don't understand why, but I think I think the writing helped with my dystonia. And he said, well, yeah, you you were making meaning in an uh, you you were making meaning in a new kind of art. And so I think that really helped has helped me a lot. <laughs> 
<laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's always no, I think who's going to talk first. <laughs> right, right, right. No, I think that's that's great about finding um, that that additional outlet. I think we've referenced that before on the podcast. I'm not sure we've actually discussed it in depth or directly, but yeah, I know that. Um, you know, so so many times when people end up with any kind of injury, it's well, well, I'm a musician now. I can't do that, and it's it's back to that, like, well, who am I, and and what am I doing with my life? <laughs> yeah, so. yeah. You know, I just read yesterday. Um, I th- Alex Klein, the oboist from the who was in the Chicago Symphony, and he had dystonia, and now he plays principal in Calgary. But just yesterday, he put uh, he posted his talk that he just gave, I think, two days ago at the University of Oregon. And he talks about what you just said. Um, but he also talks about what we just said, which is he ended up when he was first having trouble, um, he ended up um, working in uh, forming these great organizations for people in different countries to get them involved in music. And, and he kind of used his artistic fire in a different way for a little while. And now he he's playing strongly, um, also learning to avoid his dystonic triggers in various mm-hmm. ways. But it, it's he just put this whole talk up um, and it's findable. And it was really, really, int- really a good, a good, a really a, an intimate glimpse into what he has gone through and how he he is not only did he find things besides playing to go to, but he is also playing. Yeah. Yeah. I know we need more stories like that out there right now. Cause as you indicated earlier, it's people don't want to talk about it and like, well, but then you end up feeling really alone cause it's <laughs> nobody wants to talk about it. And so you're mm-hmm. like, well, but so I'm the only one who has this problem. Like, no, no, you're not. <laughs> you know? <laughs> There's about, you know, about one to 2% of musicians. So we all know, people with it and there are a lot of famous stories people have had to give up positions for it but also people who are are able to get around it and it's Mm -hmm. it's frightful it's fascinating because the brain is Mm -hmm. the brain um how the brain works is really actually fascinating but it's very it's you know it's it's difficult yeah yeah i'm glad you brought that up go ahead no, you go ahead. <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up about the numbers. So I was wondering if it is it actually a rare thing or is it just rare because we don't hear about it very often? Like I know back in the day it was um, classified as nerve damage or you had other other things. It wasn't actually this thing. So I was in a I was in a um, Facebook group this morning, a cello group, and someone was asking, "Hey, I saw this guy wearing a glove on his hand. What is it?" <clears throat> and of course, people have all kinds of ideas. It's Reynolds disease. It's, you know, he has arthritis. He has it. Nobody knows. And they're just guessing. Right. But then somebody said focal dystonia. And someone goes, is that I thought that was only for vocalists. And that's actually rare. And that's blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, mm, mm, well, <laughs> and it's funny because that was brought up this morning. So it's not really no. that rare, is it? It's not that rare. And, 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 and you know, in an orchestra, at least one person probably has it or in a university faculty probably one or two people have, i mean it's not that rare we we all know people it doesn't happen to beginning musicians it's something that's when you have highly trained your brain is um but but even some people um that i've talked with you know when they're at the university stage or doing their final um recitals sometimes it, even at those kinds of times And it doesn't happen, there are a lot of theories, but again, it's that confluence of something happens, something comes together um, um, medically or biologically and psychologically, socially, you're in a high pressure situation. There are a lot of things that come together that suddenly, it's like the atmosphere, the environment, and then your brain can go awry, but it doesn't happen always when, when someone does a certain thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so, but we all know people and athletes, they're famous athletes, Rick and Keel, the pitcher who, um, uh, would have trouble, um, getting the ball across the plate and just really wild, wild pitches. There's a famous video clip of him having that problem for the first time and just really wild pitches. Um, and psychologically, that's gotta be hard. I mean, how embarrassing. 
Well, he wrote oh. a whole book about it, although he doesn't use the term focal dystonia in the book much. But he called the yips, the yips in uh, in sports, and but then he came back and was became an outfielder. Because he could still, it's not a muscle thing. You can still throw the ball, but certain motions become confused or blocked. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, we've heard about it in gymnastics as the twisties, right? Mm -hmm. And where suddenly your body doesn't feel right when it's turning or it, it's just you, it's sudden. So um, there, there are a lot of people who, who, um, who go through this. And again, if you look at my bibliography, I put together even five years ago, there were lots of stories even back then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people have to keep quiet. And, and mm -hmm. I'm a very private person. And especially medically, I had a lot of frightening medical things as a child. So I don't like to think about medical things or talk about them. But somehow with this, I mm -hmm. Um, ended up finding a voice and and so many people were amazing and sharing with me and that helped me so much and so yeah yeah, yeah. it it um just to that end I I feel like I'm kind of like you in that way too um like we're on here talking about <clears throat> injury and, st and stuff like that openly um and I feel like a lot of people this is a little bit of a tangent but not really um a lot of people think that that means that I'm very open to discuss everything medically. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I, I don't want you to know anything about my medical history. I don't want to talk about that, but injury, I will talk about <laughs> all day long. Um, but there, there is a little bit of empowerment in that. Cause you know, before it was like, well, I can't let you know. And now it's like, you're going to know because we need to make this a standard, you know, mm -hmm. too, too many of us are injured not to talk about it, you know? So, um, yes, thank you for sharing on that note. <laughs> well, you know, at, at one point, right when I was just starting to, to feel confident again with playing, I gave a presentation at my university and it was, I, I performed some flute pieces and I read some of the poetry and I talked about dystonia and I showed a PowerPoint presentation about it. And I got the most incredible reaction afterwards. The, the students I did not know were coming up to me. There was a long line of students afterwards. And thank you for telling your story. And, and I mean, they really, they really responded to someone who was willing to be vulnerable and, and share some difficulties. And I, I had no idea I would get that reaction. I was terrified to give that present, that big concert <clears throat> presentation, but um, I, I felt in, it was worth it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. This, I mean, this is how we end the stigma that we, in, in the right. musician world around injuries, we have to talk about it openly. I mean, we don't have to say everything, but just like, me too. I have had that too. Me too, you too? Oh, you know, and suddenly we have this camaraderie. It's, it's not like you're less of a musician if this happens. Well, you must have done something wrong. Well, you must be playing mm -hmm. wrong. Well, blame, blame, blame. No, no, no. <laughs> Part of what we do, unfortunately, and it, <laughs> the way it becomes less of what we do is when we have that, you know, we talk about it. So yeah, the same thing has happened when I've given um, presentations too. It's, I, I'm always amazed at the amount of people, like the line, they're like, can I tell you my story too? It's like people finally are so excited to like, oh, someone else, someone else can hear my story and we're the same. Okay. Somebody gets it, you know, mm -hmm. and it's, mm -hmm. you just, you know, <laughs> like every time and it's, it's adorable. And I just leave the room and I know you probably did just super full of energy and all excited and happy like yay we <laughs> all together in this you know it's a really yeah. it's a really great thing so you you talking about it like that just i mean it really helps the situation yeah it brings it out of the dark yeah and i think i think too when you hear people talking about things like that sometimes it's like well what specifically worked and 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 the list is so long but it I, I just, I can mention a few kinds of things just to give a flavor. Um, mm -hmm. So just things like, um, uh, again, David Vining, the the trombonist who does help people with dystonia some, I, I had one phone conversation with him um, 
consulted with him just once and he said something interesting to me and he said where do you tongue because sometimes people with dystonia have trouble more trouble with tonguing and then i we talked about it but he said now what i'm trying to say is not that you tongue wrong but that if you switch it up mm -hmm. you you might be using a different brain pathway and wow. avoiding the trigger and so i just tried slightly different and that seemed to help so and and uh keith underwood in new york the flutist who talks so much about facial facial muscles i went to him and he talked a lot about that and farias talked a lot about specific facial muscles and the folk and the physical therapist worked with me on facial muscle exercises because i talked to uh not talked to, but emailed with Eckhart Altenmuller, the famous researcher in Germany who studies focal dystonia. And I asked him a few specific questions. And he said a lot of people um, have value in some of the facial muscle work. And so my physical therapist did that with me, which helped a lot. But now <clears throat> I play, let's see if I can grab my flute for a sec. So, um, so it's not that the way I played was wrong or the way I went to was better but i play with slightly more engaged facial muscles now um in terms of upper facial muscles even and there's mm -hmm. something about that that tricks my brain into not realizing it was so just a little more engaged face facial muscles and there's nothing inherently better about that it's just different and so i avoid mm -hmm. my triggers i slightly more um relaxed shoulder it's just just little things that are a different approach so i so i'm playing the new way instead of the old way you and, mean and facial muscles up here not just the upper part of the embouchure right exactly and and farius was um was saying um so oh i don't know if this is too complicated to get into but he was saying Okay, the difference between uh, a distinct motion and a global, a global motion. So if you swing a tennis racket and you go, whoosh, that's that's a global motion. That's all one fell swoop. Mm -hmm. Whereas a distinct motion would be the different parts of that doing something more one one part of it at a time. And I was having trouble. I would get dystonic tremors when I would try to play scales. And I was using the opening of the Mozart D major concerto as an example. And so he showed me, okay, try, come back down the scale and then go up it really quick. And then I would have no tremors. And, and he says, it's different brain pathways when you're doing something in a global motion, it's a different brain pathway. So you, you can try accessing those notes through a different brain pathway so then and so i worked with him for four days i came back the next day and i said yeah but i still can't play the mozart d major scale i could i can play a scale now the way you said with no tremors but i still can't play the mozart d major opening and he said well that's because you've been training that in with the dystonic triggers and he said pick a hundred licks that you've never seen before and learn them with that global motion. It's not that you should play something fast to avoid tremors. It's just that I was accessing, you have to learn something slow first to do it well, right? But mm -hmm. I was accessing it through a different pathway. And so he said, pick a hundred, a hundred licks that you've never played before. And so I cut out music, little, little, little technical passages. And I learned a hundred licks and I could play them all without dystonic trigger, triggers. And he said, don't come back to the Mozart. I can't remember the amount of time. It was like two months or something like that. He said, don't come back to it until you've trained in the new way to do things. And then I came back to the Mozart and I could play it. So it's, you're, you're partly messing with your muscles. You're partly messing with um, how can you ask, how can you avoid the triggers? How can you trick your body into thinking you're not going to do it this way? You're going to do it around the back door. Um, and also I remember the therapist saying to me, you know, well, you're proving you can actually play. So if you can learn to live with the anxiety of not knowing, you know, then, 
and, and I said, but that's the hard part. And she said, well, that's the part I can help you with. And, mm -hmm. and sure enough, I gradually learned that part too of how to get around those things in a psychological way. So it was, it's just, it was so many things. And I only described the tip of the iceberg to you. There were so many mm -hmm. other things. Yeah. And, and what you're talking about comes back to, I know something that we've talked about on here, Angela and I, and it's um, so many people are looking for like, well, what's the answer? Like, there's not an answer. You need to work with people and it's going to be investing in yourself. Like you've got to learn yourself. And <clears throat> that's true, whether it's dystonia or um, tendonitis or anything in between. You, know? <laughs> you can't just hope it will go away and rest and, you know, right. Just or just right. do one pathway and think that that's going to fix everything. Yeah. Like if you don't know yourself, your body <clears throat> ways to work with your mentality and your physiology, you're only going to get so far. <laughs> right. And, and, and actually some people are now saying that I'm um, says it's best to have a team of people that are helping you yeah. out. And, 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 but on the other hand, some people solve it them. I mean, some people do that themselves. And, and I really feel like most of the time I don't think about the dystonia now, luckily, luckily right. most of the time, and I'm going to be honest with you. So we originally had this scheduled to talk a couple of weeks ago. And mm -hmm. I, what I told you was a hundred percent true, which is that mm -hmm. I suddenly had work things that were, cra I mean, that work, that week was crazy. There weren't enough hours to get all the new things that work done that I needed to get done and to sit down and remember about dystonia. Cause I don't think about it every day, mm -hmm. but, but also, also I had to play something on Friday and starting mm -hmm. to look back through the dystonia stuff totally started to trigger mm -hmm. The tremors whereas yeah. most of the time i do not really have to think about it now i just know myself and know what to do and how to get around it i don't i don't i no yeah. longer end so much in that identity of i have dystonia i mean i do but i i'm pretty i'm pretty natural with things again mm -hmm. but looking through it for you immediately or not immediately but started to trigger all of it again and i thought number one i don't have enough hours in the day to think about it this week but also i've got to play something on friday and that's going to be a problem <laughs> good yeah. for you yeah and that is totally fair i mean i'm a big advocate for don't look at somebody getting injured doing something or you know think about somebody getting injured doing the thing that you're about to do like you know, <laughs> no <laughs> never do that <laughs> <laughs> don't go watch car crashes and then get in your car and go to the store. Like, just right. Don't. Mm -mm. No, it's scary. It's super scary. <laughs> don't watch uh, lifting. Li oh, because I'm in the gym a lot. Lifting no. Accidents. We don't talk about that at the gym. We don't look at that at the gym. No. No. Yeah. <laughs> I cannot with those lifting videos where people injure themselves doing stupid things like on the leg press and the, ah, no. Even people doing everything right and they just happen to have an injury. Like, I don't want every to time. Every time for the following week that I go to do that movement, I'm like, step back, get rid of it, get it out of my head. Because I'm fine. But having seen it or having thought yeah. about it, like, oh, oh, well, that's high risk. <laughs> the mo you know, those motor neurons firing, too, uh -huh. when you see somebody do something and it's like your body is almost doing mm -hmm. it. I just thought of something to tell you, which is that another thing um, that I did is to try to approach things very systematically. Fortunately, some people advised me this so that, so that I actually have documentation of all this. And I, so um, I have videos from before, during and after. I have ratings, the physical therapist who was studying me, she had me do a um, patient specific functional scale because I could function the traditional dystonia scales didn't apply to me because I could still function, but not very confidently or very well. And so we made a scale that applied to me. We took numbers at the different points, the different things she was doing. She has the data to show um, the different uh, the different things. So I do have I do have the videos from before and after. And so anyway, it's just I think that's useful and um, and uh, yeah, and now I'm I'm doing 
um, not just the poetic writing, but I am I am really going to write about it some more so that I'm I'm okay. sharing my story in a way that people can respond. That's not just talking about it, but, you know, something that 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 is both reflective, but also a little bit specific, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you mentioned, thank you for that, by the way, going back just a second ago with the the motor neurons firing when you're watching something. Um, that reminds me of why, when we talk about, um, oh, what do we call it? We talk about, uh, practice, like mental practice. That's exactly what that is. And that just, what you just said, totally gave validity to it because we just gave examples without even thinking about it. But I mean, is that something that also could maybe help someone who's dealing with this is thinking about how they approach their instrument and thinking about playing it without the issue, thinking about playing it a different way? Yeah, there's so many different ways people approach what you just said. Just one example, um, the physical therapist who was working with me, again, it wasn't just physical therapy. She had this whole, um, she was working on the brain side of things too. And, um, but she had me watching videos first of other people doing well, she had me looking at pictures too. Oh, I don't think I'll take the time to pull. I know some people can't, or only listening to this audio, so I won't pull up the pictures, but she made all these cards for me to watch of people's faces and people playing. And then, and then she had me watch videos of people doing musical, certain kinds of musical pieces. And um, then finally ones of myself playing before and I know David Vining sometimes said watching his old videos was counter uh, productive for me in the context of what the physical therapist was doing with me. It was actually productive because we did it later after I had done a whole lot of other parts of the process. So for me, that was actually really useful to see myself playing with ease. Um, mm -hmm. um, and but 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 then what you just said about the motor neurons once i went to a concert and i saw somebody who i don't think has focal dystonia or at least not know and there were tremors it was not on my own instrument but on a different instrument there were tremors and i'm sitting in the audience and my lips start quivering yeah. so it's that motor neuron yeah. I was just thinking about that the other day. Like I said that to a client we were talking about, I think this was yesterday. I said, you know what? Like we were talking about, do we, do you watch sports? Do you not watch sports? I'm like, I, I'd rather play sports than watch sports. Though everyone, every once in a while I'll watch tennis. And what's funny is every time I watch tennis right before I go play, I play better. Right. Right. And that's exactly what it is. And it's not a free thing. It's because your brain sees that and goes, oh, this is how we do. Mm-hmm. Isn't that fascinating? That's just yeah. fascinating. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So I'm serious. Yep. Don't go watch car accidents and then drive. <laughs> Don't do it. Yeah, that's not a joke. <laughs> that is definitely not a joke. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, if you want to, like, I'm curious. And you said you saw somebody playing with tremors. You did that. Did you find, were you able to, like, uh, watch or listen to another flutist who played with ease and that gave the opposite response? That's cool. That is really and, cool. And I found a video I didn't even know existed of me playing um, on an orchestra concert years before that was a very lyrical um, thing. And I'm like, wow, yeah, that's right. I can do that, you know. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, but it, but it was so many things. Oh, sometimes in dystonia for musicians, one register will become difficult. So I suddenly had trouble with high notes, but some people it's low notes or the middle. And... Um, so I actually then started strengthening my low register and playing melodies from around the world. And um, I even wrote an article for Flutus Quarterly about borrowed flute melodies from other people's music. And, and, and so I really focused on those beautiful low sounds that were still easy for me. But then I went to Farias and he's like, well, that's great, but you have to play high if you're going to play the flute. And I was like, oh yeah. So then I started building back in and doing all these different things. And, and eventually I got my highs back and now I'm very comfortable with them. But um, it is it, just, there were, again, I keep thinking of things to tell you that were parts of that process. And, and sometimes it seems mysterious. Some, you know, people will say, oh yeah, I can do it now. 
but how on earth did they get there? And it, it's really a, a process of discovery and it does require some patience. It's very frustrating, very hard, but I feel so lucky because I feel like I can play um, all this great stuff. I, you know, even when, for a time, even when I was with my students, um, I was having trouble demonstrating. That's the, you know, it had gotten to the level where it was very hard hard for me to feel I could even demonstrate, which made it harder for me to teach. But for then I got, you know, to the later stages and felt good again. And I didn't talk about it with my students at first. There was a certain time at which I suddenly started talking about it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's totally fair. Um, I mean, you know, just the, the student teacher relationship, you have to be stable enough or confident enough you know you don't want to not that we don't want to admit to our students that we don't know because obviously that's that's one of the marks of a good teacher but uh, being too vulnerable <laughs> too soon that that's a that's a tough thing to navigate so yeah i don't i don't know if you want i i don't know if you want but i could i could share the the jamma poem with you there, if you want, I could share now. I mean, I could read it if you like. Um, so people sort of see the emotion behind. Because I think that's one thing is that um, it's not just, you know, having injuries. It's not just, it's not just the injury itself. It's what, you mm -hmm. know, all the feelings that go into that or all the things that go behind it. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. But I just, I know that's just, it's, it's just my little different perspective on things is to, is to transfer it to the writing. So, mm -hmm. all right. Yeah. So um, this poem has a quote that goes with it. That is from Cleveland orchestra conductor, um, Franz Velser Moost and it's the quote is it's the voice of that person comes through the instrument so that goes with the poem mm -hmm. and it's that is um, so true yeah so it's mus musicians focal dystonia when dystonia scrambled my brain signals like a virus corrupts a hard drive I was sure I could not spend 10,000 hours retraining my brain to play the flute a new way. But when I heard that a luthier and his son restored the Holocaust violins to free their lost voices, I changed my mind. If I am silenced, you would not miss me, but the way my vibrato on the first C sharp of L'Apremidi d'Enfant conjures up a sultry summer afternoon. The way your hips swing when I play a tango. The way you hear whales when I close my lips around the mouthpiece to hum voice of the whale. The original 10,000 hours I will tick in reverse, a feat as tricky as learning to ride a backwards bicycle until once again, I can curve quiet fingers over the keys, whistle my lips to laser the tone down the silver tube, your body ringing in sympathetic vibration. That perfectly, d d d words, <laughs> just like perfectly <laughs> stated. Like, I felt like I understood. I don't have it. And I felt like, especially the, the way a virus scrambles a hard drive. It's like, oh, mm -hmm. <laughs> that, yeah. that really brought it home. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so. Wait, did you write that for something specific? You did, didn't you? I, I just wrote it and, and it ended up, you know, the, the, there's a poetry and med medicine column in the Journal of the American Medical Association, and they wanted it. They 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 made a specific comment. We want we want this. We want we want to show people this. So good. Yeah. So I, I again, it's um, you know, when I first started writing poetry, some of my first poems were medical, and um, I had been very quiet about medical things before, and. 
um, both of my poetry mentors said the same thing to me at different moments um, when they heard I'd had something out there published and and they both said um, now you're part of the conversation and I I just felt like me being able to join the conversation was helpful to me you know not everybody can do that at at, at certain points of injury or but for me that proved to be one of the helpful things because both because people were talking with me and then eventually I was communicating with them yeah and and asking for help too that was something that was um, useful to me yeah <laughs> well, I don't have any other questions I think you yeah I'm like I feel I feel kind of wrong continuing a talk after the poem you know? <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> it was so beautifully said. I mean, oh, yeah. Thank you. So we really appreciate you sharing your story. I know that's right. probably whoever is going to listen to this is uh, whoever is listening to this right now. Might this might be really what they needed to hear? So yes. that they are not by themselves, and there is hope, and that somebody else gets it. Yeah, and several and there are, gets and there are outlets while you do it, which is just such a good thing. Mm -hmm. Such a good thing to hear. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Well, I'll send you the links that I have to the, those, you know, those articles and the bibliography and yes. the poem. I can send you the art, the link to that too. That will be great. Be great. We'll put all mm -hmm. of those in the show notes. Yes. Um, <laughs> as you, as you so graciously mentioned that you, you don't mind chatting with people. If anybody wants to reach out, where should they find you? Um, I'll put my website on there so that they can find me through that. And I just, I really appreciate what you, the two of you both do with all your work with people and with uh, musicians too. I mean, I know you work with people who aren't just musicians too, but I really appreciate that. Thank you for, thank you for helping us. <laughs> <laughs> like you said, it's a team approach. Yes. It definitely is. Yes. Yeah. <sighs> well, thank well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Like I said, I feel I feel so wrong to keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you very much for your time and your story um, and all the information that we're going to put in the links. Make sure that people have access to it. Um, and if you're listening out there uh, and you liked this or you want to comment, uh, tell us your story, please feel free to do so. Um, as always, uh, like shares help us get the uh, get the information out there to other musicians who need it because we know they do um and uh reviews for uh whatever podcast platform you're on those help us a lot if you like what we're doing yes please thank you, <laughs> thank you for joining us we'll see you next time hey musicians did you know that up to 90 percent of musicians will experience playing related pain or injury over the course of their career how many hushed conversations have you heard about a lingering quote shoulder pain or a weird tingling in your fingers or maybe low back pain, or a crampy weakness, or maybe you or your colleague just says, I just have to get through the gig. And you watch them pop Advil like candy, maybe flush it down with whiskey. How many times have we seen something like this? So many, right? Well, it's time we start talking about our struggles, our pain, our frustrations in a private space where we don't just complain and mobilize and blindly stretch, but we learn how to strengthen our muscles, our career successes, and build each other up. I've got a brand new program that combines all of these things, and I want you to be a part of it. It's a community, not a workout. It's a community with group coaching and great content that in 12 weeks will have you understanding more about your body, what you need, and how you work so you can avoid that career-threatening injury. The three things that musicians don't want. We don't want to be injured. We don't want to have a lack of stamina. And... We don't want to be clueless, a.k.a. when you hurt, who do you go see? Just a quote doctor? Well, this program addresses all of those things. You're going to walk away with an immense knowledge of who to see. You're going to be empowered because you're going to know what to do should you ever get injured or should you have a colleague that gets injured. You will be able to actually offer appropriate advice. You're also going to learn about the body and the anatomy as it relates to playing your instrument and your own anatomy. And then you're going to learn how to build not just your strength and endurance, but you're going to learn how to design your own corrective exercise program. So I hope you will join me in this new program. It's called the Music Strong Pilot Program, Job Security for Musicians.